See, I am doing something new. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? In the desert I make a way, in the wasteland rivers. These lines from the first reading from the prophet Isaiah reveal what God's great desire is for us. His plan to renew us, to make things new. And I'm sure that many of us are ready for the newness of spring. For the rain to come and bring more life back to the land. As we enter to the final weeks of Lent leading to Holy Week, we're reminded that Jesus came for this reason, to make things new, to bring newness of life to us through his passion, his death, and resurrection. And Jesus wants to do something new for each one of us who fall so often under the weight of sin and death. And we see him doing this for the woman in the gospel today. For those who have been doing the Live Lent together, small groups, you would have be familiar with this passage. This was from earlier in, in, in this season of Lent. We reflected upon this story of the woman caught in adultery. She is shamed for her sins and brought before Jesus to be punished. But Jesus doesn't condemn her. Instead, he does something new. He forgives her sins. Go and sin no more, he says. And we also have this great opportunity to be renewed in the life of grace as well whenever we come and avail ourselves of the sacrament of reconciliation. And in thinking of this kind of call to newness of life, there is also something else new that is happening that many of you have heard about, uh, but may have some kind of questions and concerns about it. The Archdiocese has announced a new pastoral planning initiative, building upon the work that's previously been done. And a month ago or so, we, we read the Archbishop's letter and invited you to go and visit uh, journeyoffaith.org, where they have outlaid some initial information. And I've had many conversations with different individuals already uh, about what this may mean for us in our area. Uh, Though much of the specifics have not yet been made public as they're finalizing their materials, but it will be coming out later this month. And... So there'll be a lot more clarity in those areas where we may have questions. Um, So while the, the, the previous pastoral planning that we've done in our area, we've had an effect upon bringing our six parishes together, what's different in this one is that it's going to be for the entire archdiocese. And change, of course, can be difficult, and facing new, new things that we're not used to can bring anxieties. But the realities that we face make this necessary. So for myself, I, I know that knowing more the reasons for why a change has to be made can help me to accept it more easily and to make those necessary changes. And there's really three critical realities that require we go through this journey of faith. The first is that there de- has been a decrease in mass attendance. That Second, there's a decrease in the number of priests that we have. And third, that there's a population shift and decrease, in particular, in our rural populations. So if we look at each of those three, first, that mass attendance in our diocese for a while now has been decreasing. It's decreased by 42% since 2003. And we are not immune to that in our areas. Decreased mass tents. I'm sure that you've noticed this over the years. On a typical Sunday right now, our parish family, over 40% of parishioners that are registered are not joining us each week. And that amounts to over 750 people amongst our parishes, which, if all of them were coming, they wouldn't be able to fit in all three of the churches here on the northern end. It's a significant number of our brothers and sisters. We also know the trends that there's fewer younger adults that are choosing to continue to identify as being Catholic. So that's the first thing. And second, as of today, we have 105 priests that are serving in the Archdiocese of Omaha. But in 10 years... By 2032, it's projected to be down to only 80 priests. 
And this projection is based upon retirements as well as a a hopeful assumption that we'll have two ordinations each year. Of course, this means, therefore, that we need to plan for 25 fewer priests through the course of that time. Finally, we have seen a dramatic population shift from rural areas in Nebraska to the urban centers. Rural Nebraska today has a lower population overall than it did in 1890. The the peak of the rural population was around 1927, and it's been declining since then. Specific to our areas, uh, Holt, Antelope, Boone counties have experienced a a 12 to 15.5% decrease in the population the last 20 years for a total of 3,400 people fewer in these counties than 20 years ago. Whereas, compared to the urban areas in our state, I've seen a dramatic growth in population. Just to give one example, the largest parish in Omaha, St. Wenceslas, has a larger Sunday attendance than when you add up the smallest 50 rural parishes. So these three realities, that there's a decreased mass attendance, that there's a decreased number of priests, that the population is is shifted in in the way that it has, has brought us to need to go through the pastoral planning on a level that is archdiocesan-wide, not just for our area. The planning will impact every Catholic parish and church in our archdiocese, and that means both here as well as, as Father John told you last week, where I'm also now being called to go next this, this summer in my new assignment. And this all can appear quite daunting. What are we to do? Well, I want to encourage you to see the opportunities for great goodness that can come from all of this. As we have heard in these readings, Jesus desires for us something new. Pope Francis wrote in his encyclical, The Joy of the Gospel, that I dream of a missionary impulse capable of transforming everything so that the church's customs and ways of doing things, the times, the schedules, the language, the structures can be suitably channeled for the evangelization of today's world rather than for her self-preservation. See, fear and sorrow for what we might have to change for, for too long now has really trapped us in an attitude of self-preservation of old ways. But we're at a point where we can't do that anymore. We're called to be missionary, to order our parishes for evangelization. Our parishes don't just exist for ourselves. Our parishes exist for everybody else who don't, who don't come here. It's why we exist. Our baptism calls us to go forth and to live our life of faith not only encountering Jesus ourselves, but once we've met him, to help others now come and meet Jesus as well. And that's why we've been putting so much emphasis on that live Lent together this, this season. Before we're able to go and invite others to join us, we have to know that there's something worth, worth inviting them to. And we have to meet him first. And for those that I invited to be leaders... That also is part of calling each of you as as lay faithful to be more intentional and more active in inviting others to encounter Jesus too. And then it felt like, well, I didn't really have anybody invite me. What kind of points out that there's not very many of us who are willing to take that up yet. We have to grow to learn to do it. The the fifth week scripture passage for Live Lent Together is Jesus' conversation with Martha about the resurrection. See, she's she's grieving the the death of her brother Lazarus. And and so it's hard for her to to hold on to the belief that Jesus has the power to raise from the dead. And so when we were praying with that scripture passage, um, but doing that with my classes at Pope John each, each week, and so when we were praying with that, both of, both of the classes brought this up, that it seemed that Jesus was teaching us that we need to trust in God, that he has a plan for us, even when we can't fully see it. And so that applies to us in this situation too, that even though we will go through grieving, 
in a sense, and probably already have been with the changes we've already gone through, a certain grieving of the changes to the ways in which things have always been done, new life can come even out of death. That when we allow Jesus to work in our life, he can do something new. In order for this planning process to be a true journey of faith, For our whole parish family, we've decided to consecrate ourselves, all of our parishes, this whole process to our Blessed Mother. She is our mother who wants nothing more for us than for us to meet her son, to fall deeply in love with him. Uh, To do a consecration is is an act by which something or someone is is separated from, from being ordinary to being dedicated for a sacred purpose. And so by consecrating ourselves to Mary, we're going to be asking that she help us to see and to seek her son's will throughout this whole process rather than cling to our own. And so starting today, we're going to pray the memorare at the end of the intercessions in place of the vocation prayer. And we're not saying that we shouldn't be praying for vocations. We certainly should. So I encourage you to continue to do that. But we want to, leading up to making an act of consecration on the weekend of May 1st, which is the beginning of the the Marian month, the month of Mary. Um, And then we're going to continue throughout the year as we go through the process of this pastoral planning. We want to continue to pray the memorare, that we will consecrate this whole thing to our Blessed Mother. Mary, our mother, your son Jesus has come to make all things new. Help us to have hearts that are open to his will. God says, see, I am doing something new. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? In the desert I make a way, in the wasteland rivers.